<laughs> All right. Well, kitchen I, party. I provide, what... the, I provide the baseline woos. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Um, kitchen party is a weekly live show where we bring some of our favorite friends in food to talk about all things food, recipes, cooking, what's happening uh, in you know technology, whatever it is that we want to talk about, and we hope that you will join in into the conversation. Uh, every week we do this at 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can always check back our website, bakespace.com slash news, for all of our archives, and let's everyone introduce themselves. So should we just go down the line? So I am Babette Pepi, the founder and CEO of bakespace.com. Daniel, do you want to take it over next and yeah, tell us just a little my, bit about you? In my previous life, I was making videos about street food for a show called Vendor TV, but now I am in the barbecue business opening up a restaurant in New York, in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm Jeff Halk. I'm the food writer for the Tampa Tribune and TBO.com. I do a podcast called Table Conversations. I do not have a restaurant opening in either New York or Los Angeles, but I one day hope to eat a lot of barbecue at his restaurant. Hi, I'm uh, Christina Vanny, and I am a, uh, a food writer with um, BetterRecipes.com, which is a, uh, a crowdsourced, uh, user-generated website that is uh, alongside Better Homes and Gardens. And I'm Renee Lynch. I'm a writer at the LA Times. I write about food and a bunch of other stuff as well. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, today's topic is tailgating. Now, the moment I heard football was back, I was like, oh, I'm really not sure. I'm uh, A, intimidated by football, and B, <laughs> I do like alcohol, so I, I appreciate, I appreciate Let's, the basics. Let me drink to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm jealous. I didn't have time to get a drink. <laughs> Well, we, uh, well, we, you know, we, the idea really is about giving folks uh, some tips, some recipes, some ideas, some things for them to think about. Um, one of the inspirations, uh, one of the reasons why Christina was invited was I had seen a blog post that you did on tailgating. So do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, why it is that you decided to write a blog post about it? Were you getting feedback from some of the users? Were you... Um, what was what was the inspiration for the for the post originally? Um, well, it was a few different things. Um, I th one, I just think that like tailgate game day kind of foods are just really fun because it's it's a it's a scenario where you don't have to worry about like calories and all that mumbo jumbo. You just get to like eat super yummy indulgent stuff. So I think those recipes are just fun to come up with. And then um, I also um, I actually just recently hosted a Twitter party uh, with Frito Lay. So obviously lots of chips and dip and all that kind of fun you know game. Day kind of fair, and so just kind of all you know. As I was thinking about those ideas and those recipes, it just kind of happened. So I did a blog post about it. Awesome. Now, Daniel, I know that you're the king of barbecue now. What you inspired know, what? You know, it's quite funny, and you don't know this. None of you know this. Nobody in the world knows this, actually. But last year, <laughs> <The> secret. <laughs> last year, I spent um, almost every Saturday at Meadowlands Stadium filming the pilot for a show about tailgating food. Um, it ultimately it didn't happen, but we but it but it was really interesting to kind of have that exposure. Um, and yeah, barbecue is a huge thing. Grilling in general, uh, you see more grilling than barbecue because of the amount of time that you have out there. But um, it's it's a great thing and, and there are a lot of things that you can do to make it great and not just make it like charred, bland uh, you know, disgusting stuff. <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting because you come from it from like the people who are literally tailgating at their car. I yeah. think Christina comes from it of people who are having parties. We were just talking about that before yeah. we went live about how the word tailgating has transformed automobiles. Like we talk about that game day recipes, tailgating recipes, they're kind of synonymous now. So um, what, what when you cook it out of the back of your car, what do you have to prepare for? Isn't that... Crazy. Well, I mean, it was <laughs> the people. The thing that's interesting is that people put tens, twenty, thirty thousand dollars into their tailgate rig. Some people get really serious about it. We've, I, I saw people that bought entire buses, old school mm -hmm. buses, and turned them into their mobile kitchens, oh. complete with you know grills that pull out and satellite TV. A lot of people <laughs> don't even bother going into the stadium because the experience outside is so much more enjoyable. Mm -hmm. They no. still have to pay for the parking. That's the one. <laughs> That's uh, Daniel, what happened to that show? Because that sounds like an amazing show. I tune in for that one. Um, 
I think that actually what started to happen is, uh, from a content perspective, it's it's a little bit redundant. You know, there, there's kind of the same thing on the grill all the time, which is potentially something that we're maybe going to solve for the folks that are watching today. But a lot of a lot of what people are doing is the same stuff, and so you know, when you're kind of creating a show, you, you need a little mm -hmm. bit more diversity. Yeah. You know, I think that um, the thing about tailgating that's interesting to me is that the the food has improved um, as the devices have improved, the technology has improved. So you know, like if I go out to uh, the uh, Raymond James Stadium where the Bucks play, I'm as likely to see a four-stroke horsepower, uh, twenty horsepower blender as I am to see a Weber grill anymore. And there's all these great sort of battery-powered appliances with big, huge uh, capacity that people are finding new ways to, to play with it. And I didn't know uh, if you had seen a gadget that really kind of impressed you, Daniel. Well, I mean, it was it's some of it's ridiculous, you know. Like yeah. we saw people that had that got. I mean, some of it was really innovative. Solar powered ovens, like they actually right. were baking things wow. with solar powered ovens. And yeah, wow, that's the, you, crazy. Like, like we saw so many um, battery powered uh, appliances, like uh, you know margarita mixers that are that like can, you can pop in the battery pack from your cordless drill to make margaritas in February in in New York <laughs> City right like who needs that but oh uh, wait I do that's that is yeah <laughs> um, yeah I mean and then that's the thing like people are loyal you know the, these folks are getting out I mean obviously I'm in the Northeast so it's it's a little bit colder than Los Angeles or you know if you're down in New Orleans but Man, the dedication that people have to, to get now for the tailgate is pretty serious. Christina, you know, we were talking about it earlier about, about sort of tailgating becoming this all-encompassing thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it about doing indoor tailgating that seems to be um, appealing to people? Uh, so, you know, from a home entertainment standpoint. Yeah, well, I mean, I think my audience is uh, definitely skews very female. So I think that, I mean, speaking for myself, like, I know nothing about football. But, I mean, it's more fun to plan the party. You know what I mean? And if you know mm -hmm. that people are going to come and it's a way to sort of get people to gather around the TV for some sort of experience, then, um, you know, it's just like planning any other party. But you get to kind of like, you know, shop for some fun props or do some silly things or, you know, make things in the shape of a football. You know, it's kind of an excuse to, to be a little silly, you know, and do some sort of like kind of like kitschy little things but it's accepted in that kind of party you know sure. so it's kind of fun that way well we're eternally grateful that empanadas look just like footballs and you can eat them <laughs> that's true that's great <laughs> christina what are some of the prop uh the props that uh that you've come across that are fun for people to add to their parties Oh, well, I mean, I just, I love just hunting through, um, you know, like the dollar bin at Target or like the dollar store. You know, it's fun to do stuff like with team colors. That's always mm -hmm. good. Um, you know, I made a cheese ball in the shape of a, of a football and took like roasted red peppers, you know, for the, the what do you call it, the seams? The laces? Or the, uh -huh. Yeah, the laces. Yeah, stuff like that. So, you know, I've seen like deviled eggs, you know, where you pipe on something to look like, look like a football. You know, just, I don't know, it just seems kind of, kind of silly and kitschy and fun, you know, it's just kind of an excuse to play a little bit with your food. There's a big thing out here are the uh, t uh, tortilla chips that are in the shape of footballs and they make them like in the car cardinal colors for uh, USC and then the, the, Bruin, uh, the Bruin colors for uh, UCLA. And those chips taste horrible, but I always have to buy them for the party because you just figure I have to have something with like the school colors, right? Yeah. You can't go without that. It's funny. A friend of mine from college sent me a Facebook message, I think like last year around homecoming time. And I went to, I went to Northwestern where the school colors are purple. And he goes, what can I cook that's purple? And we have like no purple foods, you know? I mean, I said like purple potatoes. I don't know. Oh, that's a good one. That's a yeah, good one. but it's, it's purple tough potato when salad. When your when your school colors are not uh, as easy as you know red and yellow. Right. <laughs> Maybe eggplant. <laughs> yeah, well that gets so dark. I don't know. I was I was trying to brainstorm. It's hard to find real purple. You know. You know, it's funny you say that because this morning uh, I saw on TV that there was a, a Food Network show on tailgating that had I guess it had like. Guy Fieri on it, and Eddie George, a bunch of celebrities, and uh, and one of the teams that was competing was from Minnesota, and they used purple potatoes. Ah. But then they also made like this um, yogurt dip, and they put some purple food coloring in it, and it was like, okay, there's some food that you can accept that's game yeah. color, and others you just want to just kind of go with the standard color. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a little scary. 
I think that when you're in that position, then maybe you have to just like step back from the team colors and figure out what the other you know accoutrement of of uh, the event is. You know, right. like I remember a long while ago, I had a catering. I'm sorry, not a catering, a tailgating party to go to, and we had to bring things that were thematic. So we did a we did a like a nine layer dip, but we used ground beef as the second to top layer, and then we kind of used green guacamole to sort of pipe out the shape of a football, and did the lace with um with some sour cream. So so oh. so you get creative and kind of attack it from the other end and just kind of look at the themes more generally. And maybe just do a purple tablecloth, right, and leave it at exactly. that. <laughs> exactly. So what are the what are the absolute um, you know, staples of tailgating that you think you have to have, Christina, when you're entertaining at home? Is it what? guacamole? Is it chips? What is it? Oh, well, you know, I was actually thinking more from, like, what, what I, when I'm at the grocery store, what I'm going to grab, and I, I think one of the go-to things has got to be a couple of rotisserie chickens, because that, it's like, you know, it's already done, and you can kind of pick it apart and then use that, you know, tender, juicy chicken into a lot of different, um, a lot of recipes, you know, a lot of dips and stuff like that. So that's one of my go-to things. It's such a time saver. You know, it's already it's already done. And that's a know. great idea. Yeah, or go to Costco and get the three pack of like the chickens all lined up. <laughs> uh -huh. So what, that's one. That's one of them. What kind of dip do you use that uses chicken? I'm interested in that. Oh, you know, we actually um, just a couple weeks ago, our site hosted like a game day uh, recipe contest, uh -huh. and so someone, I think she called it like a, a chili chicken enchilada dip. So it's kind of like Ooh. all those flavors and enchiladas, and um, it was sort of stirred in with with um, you know some some cheesy goodness and stuff. And you just dip it, you know, scoop it right up, and it was it was good. So oh, it was the winner good. of the contest. So that sounds and that good. that was it was really fast and easy. You know, just getting all all the rotisserie chicken already already made. It seems to me that when you decide you're going to tailgate, you kind of, as you start, you have like a critical decision to make, and that's going to be how much will you actually make at the tailgating event versus how much, like, are you just going to make it all at home and pack it up and have very little cooking to do? Because the cooking there, as Daniel was pointing out, is can kind of be an ordeal, and it, it feels to me, I, I tailgate at USC games a lot, and it feels like we truck all this stuff out. And it's like we've barely sat down and like made something when it's time to like pack it all up and bring it back to the car so we can get into the game. And it's it's kind of an ordeal. And I feel like it's it's easier when you can just bring everything from home. But that's a decision that you have to make before you you get out there, right? Well, it's either it's an ordeal or it's a ritual. Some people might look at it. Ah, you know. very good. <laughs> you know? I like that. <laughs> I think it's a ritual, but I I can offer a few. So to me, like you know, some of the things that you often see at a tailgate, whether it's you know at somebody's home residential or it's at the thing, is the grill. And to me, the grill is the devil. It is one of the most abused devices, right? And and it can really ruin your food. It can literally scorch it all up. Um, and I see I see a few giant mistakes whenever we are at the tailgates uh, with with folks that are using their grill. And the, the largest thing that we that I think that I find is the use of lighter fluid. Um, you'll you'll see people just soaking uh, their charcoal in lighter fluid, and um, it can create such an acrid, horrible, bitter flavor for the whole burn uh, of your time using the grill. Um, the other biggest problem with with it is just like it can get way too hot, and ultimately sort of just char anything that you put on it. Mm -hmm. Not to mention all that lighter fluid around all that alcohol. Probably not a good combination, right? <laughs> so what are you supposed to what are you supposed to do? I mean, because you're at, like I'm assuming people are using lighter fluid to kind of like get the thing going, right? So how do you how do you kind of make that happen in a short period of time? I mean, I think that the best thing that you can bring is a charcoal chimney. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a ten dollar device. You bring a little uh, charcoal and you can get some you know, newspaper and you'll be up and running in 15 minutes. And ultimately, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of keep the flavor a lot more neutral. From a cooking perspective, I think that one of the biggest things that people don't do, but should do, is create zones. Um, because you only have one cooking surface, if you bank all of your charcoal over to one side, now you have a hotter zone for direct cooking and a cooler zone for indirect cooking. It's a really great way to sort of have a balance throughout the entire cooking process. Um, and I think that the, the biggest thing is that you don't have to cook everything directly on the heat. Uh, I, I think that some of the best tailgating food I've had um, includes people bringing a cast iron pan and popping it right on top of the griddle. You can, you can sear off burgers and then you don't lose any of that great fat that's on the burger. 
you won't have any direct burning from things like hot dogs. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're at an early game, you can pop on things like eggs uh, and bacon, and you can kind of cook that up and have breakfast sandwiches or whatever else you want. That, that yeah, sounds great. It's funny, you, it's funny you mention that because I, I, um, there's all different kinds of tailgating, and there's some games that I know uh, that run a little bit early, and a lot of people breakfast tailgate as well. So, you know, it's, it's kind of tough to, to plan sometimes because, you know, you might have an earlier – tailgate that kind of runs through there's the game and then people still want to eat after lunch so you have to think what kind of food can you have prepared for afterwards as well to kind of notch on that notch on while uh, the traffic is kind of thinning out um, what do you suggest do you guys either of you have suggestions on sort of before food versus after food well I think that you know before food anything that's quick to me I mean uh, Eggs are, are like a really easy thing to be whipping out. Um, and there, there are certain, I think, certain barbecue-y things that can go really well uh, both before or after and can work really well with some pre-planning. A, a great instance is pulled pork. Uh, it's, pulled pork is one of those things that you can certainly make on a grill. But you can also really, really easily... Uh, you know, rub down with the sort of pork shoulder with your favorite sort of spice, throw it in your oven the night before, um, or in a crock pot, and it'll be ready to go in the morning. If you're still sort of setting up a grill, then you can pop that right on the grill and get some nice caramelization on the outside before you mm. actually start to shred it up. Alternately, if you kind of went down a little bit on the amount that you're cooking it at home, you can kind of leave that on a, on a low grill while you go into the tailgate by the time that you're out, it's going to be falling off of the bone. And it's one of the best pieces of meat to use because it's so tolerant of overcooking. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, you can, if, if it does dry out, which is almost uh, impossible, you can throw a little sauce on it or even just a little bit of beef stock or chicken stock and rehydrate it. But on the whole, that really never happens. Wow. Daniel, I want to make sure I'm following. You're saying you would keep that cooking or somebody would keep that cooking while they go into the game and have it ready when they come out? Did I follow that correctly? That, I, I mean, I would. I, I don't see, oh, that's I don't awesome. see a huge problem with that. <laughs> but again, we're cooking 24 hours a day with barbecue, uh -huh. so you know, uh, my, my uh, trust in it is a little bit different. One of my favorite things to do, and this is, this is a pro tip, um, what you can do, which is, which is kind of a lot of fun, is you can pack a pork shoulder uh, you can just buy a pork shoulder from your grocery store. It's also a really inexpensive cut of meat. Usually it's coming out in at around, let's say, $1.25 to $1.50 a pound. So it's super inexpensive. Um, you can take the rind off of it, the skin off of it, and you can literally mix half sugar and half salt, and you can pack your pork shoulder in that, leave it in a Tupperware in your fridge. This is if you're so ambitious, right? Leave it in a Tupperware in your fridge, and each day drain out some of the liquid. What you're basically doing is you're curing it, and then you cook it on a grill, and what you're ultimately going to be coming out with is like bacon, baconized pulled pork. It's a really, oh, really oh, amazing. That needs to happen. That Holy is awesome. Oh. A good thing. So, so wait, wait, as, as the okay. only vegetarian <laughs> in the room, Whoa. Would, you, would you just put that on a grill? You, you certainly, I mean, it depends on how much time you have. You can certainly put it on a grill. You can... Um, it's also, I mean, again, pulled pork holds really well it, before you pull it. So if you wanted to, you could smoke it. You could do it at home uh, the day before and just throw it in a cooler, and it'll stay. If you wrap that up in some foil, wrap a blanket around it, and put it in a regular cooler, I mean, it's going to stay hot for 6 to 10 hours. Um, it's, it's only as soon as you pull it open and start to pull it apart that it starts to die really quickly, and then you want to eat it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But I bet that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, I feel like a lot of the tailgates are super meat heavy. You yeah. know, I mean, it's meatheads that are often going to them outside the stadium. So what do you do? What do you do when, when you're surrounded by, you know, people that love to, uh, to sort of be carnivorous? You know, well, first of all, I respect everyone's opinion to eat whatever they want. I, I totally, you know, it's been about four years now since I've turned vegetarian, and uh, it's my personal choice. Um, but I find that things that are events like Thanksgiving or a big game day where everyone's watching the Super Bowl, um, I end up eating all the potato chips. <laughs> I end up, like I just like start nibbling on little things because um, everyone forgets about the sides. They assume that the sides are just like 
a piece of corn on the cob or um, I don't know they just nobody thinks that a side should be f like filling enough uh -huh. that even eating on its own um, I don't know help me help me help me help me help everyone who's in my I, problem <laughs> well, I like I really like um, cold noodle salads because it's one oh. of those things you can make it the night before mm. it tastes even mm -hmm. better after it's sitting in the refrigerator um, and that you know you could kind of put pack full of uh, you know vegetables and all that kind of stuff so I think that's that's always a good go to vegetarian idea. and everybody likes it too so no, yeah it's good. um I, I think everybody should get to know their good friend mr. hummus <laughs> and, and, um, and you know I think both of you uh, uh, Daniel and Christina have made good points about the night before making it ahead of time um, the thing you want uh, to do I think when you tra tailgate is to actually participate in the tailgate that you're having and you know not try and make Thanksgiving dinner on a Sunday morning or a Saturday morning um, are there are there certain things like you talked about the noodle salad Christina are there other foods that you would suggest are good night night ahead uh, prep foods oh, gosh um, let me think well I was I was actually just thinking along vegetarian stuff I, I a lot of times I do like a big sub sandwich or something like that you know but and have a vegetarian version let me try to think what else is good night before one um, of my favorite things that's that is perfect for night before and it's it's kind of like it's its own category right chili it can be ah, vegetarian, yes. it can be pork it can be beef um, it can be a chicken chili it could be a tofu chili. And one of the nice things about it, I think, for vegetarians is that even your most veggie-friendly chili is still going to feel hearty and it's still going to feel like mm -hmm. they're actually getting sustenance and they're getting something that you know feels like it was made for them as opposed to the, the sort of scraps left over from the chip bowl. Well, that could even be kind of fun as, you know, as the season goes on and maybe you're getting a little bored with the same old kind of foods. Maybe even the people that you're, you're tailgating with or partying with have like a chili cook-off. You know, have each person bring their favorite version and then, then you have a whole spread to choose from. Just, you know, maybe shake things up a bit. I love that idea. That's yeah. great. That sounds fun. You know, I think uh, Dan makes a good point about it being a little um, meat-centric. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm pro-meat, as anybody who knows me knows, um, very much in the pro-meat category. That's how I vote, actually. I'm, I, choose, <laughs> I, choose, uh, I choose candidates based on their meat proclivities. But, uh, um, you know, I think if you kind of almost saw, think in the opposite, what would freshen something up, a salad or fruit or something like that, it's amazing to me in that there's like this middle stage of a tailgate where people, like, start to have a little bit of meat regret and I think they, they, uh, they, they think, well, maybe I can kind of balance this with a melon ball or something like that. And, it, and it, it's funny how fast that stuff kind of goes, too. Um, is, do you have any fruit or, or salads that you guys would suggest? You know, lately, I'm obsessed with Israeli couscous. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I just think it's Ooh. so good. And it's, that's awesome. it's kind of that halfway between pasta and couscous somehow, you know? And I feel like that's just fun. People don't see it as often, so they're kind of like, ooh, what's this? Um, I'm obsessed with that lately. And then also the little um, uh, bocconcini, you know, tiny mozzarella balls. Oh. I mean, <laughs> I've seen ones, like, in big all the way down to ones that are, like, pearl size. And I think yeah. they're just so fun just to throw in... I mean, especially something like couscous or cold noodles, something like that. So that's, that's, those are my new obsessions. You know, I was just at a party where they had um, little kebabs that were small little cherry tomatoes with, the, with those cheeses, and then it would be like another tomato, uh -huh. and they were perfect because I can't remember if I was at a wedding or a party, but it was easy to grab <laughs> off and eat, you know, like with one hand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, it can but be I like, think a, like a caprese salad on a stick. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that that would be cool. There's a uh, there's there's a book called I'm sorry, but, but there's That's a book okay. called On a Stick by uh, a photographer. His name is Matt. Uh, I think it's Armender is who's got a bunch of great stuff that you just put on a stick and uh, and that makes anything on a stick makes good sort of Neanderthal tailgate food. I think. In a way. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you can take um, inspiration. Oh, oh, sorry. No, please. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that it works really well for the last minute tailgater. You can spin it into it. It's an interactive thing, right? So you get a bunch of sticks, soak them in water, have a ton of fixins, light up the grill, and everybody gets to make their own kebabs to right idea. over the grill. And, you know, your labor time is cut down to nothing. Yeah, I think the, the build your own blank, you know, like that kind of concept I think is great. It's good for parties. It's good to get people together, you know, get people uh, talking and mingling and interacting. So that's always a good go-to idea. 
Tacos no, fall we... into that category. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Tacos. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I like that. Build your own taco bar. There you go. See, yeah. um, I think I think we've all been very polite about this and dancing around it because you know we're all sort of meeting each other for the first time. But can we just talk about alcohol? I was just gonna say that. <laughs> I was just gonna say what about the booze? Um, because you know, I, you can bring all the charcoal you want, but the real fire starter is in the cooler. As as Renee takes a drink of wine. <laughs> I'm Actually, so jealous. Did, did you guys know that today is National Vodka Day? No. Yes. Really? Yes. Wow. Yes. And supposedly there's all kinds of like weird combinations like vodka and salmon. I don't know how it's salmon infused vodka. It sounds disgusting. Uh, hey, I made but... I made some fried chicken vodka a couple weeks ago and it was awesome. Really? Swear to God. What is fried chicken vodka? Oh, Renee. <laughs> and why am I you only hearing about this now, Jeff? <laughs> you, take, you take fried chicken skin. Okay, like I just get it from the grocery store. And you put it in a mason jar with some vodka. And you let it kind of sit for, I don't know, a couple days, two, three, four, five days in the freezer. And it sort of infuses, and then you take it out, and it kind of, you skim it, put it back in. You know, you kind of do this process where you filter it over and over. And let me tell you something. It sounds disgusting, yes. but um, <laughs> the idea of liquid fried chicken is probably one of wow. the best ideas man has ever created. Did you have it by itself or mix it with something? No, no, no. It's all by itself. You put uh, it over ice, and it's – you see, I started because I went to this bar, and this guy was doing this, and he had bacon whiskey, which was great, but it tasted too much like whiskey and not enough like bacon. And then he did a, uh, a coffee bean vodka, and so I made I tried that at home, and that went well enough. He was like, yeah, try, try some fried chicken vodka, and I was like, okay, and it was just awesome. Wow. So, you know, that kind of stunt drinking at a uh -huh. tailgate, I think is always a good a good move. That sounds amazing. <laughs> but does it, I mean, what do you, do you eat it with something or? or oh, no, you just do a shot. It's just, you, know? you do a, sh okay, you're doing a shot of. Because if you're planning to throw up during the game, you really <laughs> want to kind of plan ahead um, and have that fried chicken, you know, going into the stadium so people go, what does that smell? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> thinking have that for breakfast with waffles and you got like the chicken and waffles oh, yes that is you're coming to my tailgate you're coming to my tailgate now i gotta make waffle vodka hey yeah with some maple syrup or something infused in there it'd be good oh. why am i yelling i don't know because <laughs> you're so excited oh. wow i so, love fried chicken but i'm still not convinced on that but you say it's good i'm gonna try it jeff no, it's it is beyond good. It is freakish good. Okay. And I don't know if this nope. is a just a Brooklyn thing, but do you guys know what picklebacks are? No. I've heard of it. <laughs> no. So I, this is something that started very much in our neighborhood, I think, and it's slowly making its way over. But it works well at a tailgate because it's inevitable that at a tailgate you have a jar of pickles coming out, and and with pickles come pickle brine and right. that's not to be wasted that's that's gold so a pickleback um, is you buy like old granddad you buy like cheap whiskey mm -hmm. stuff that burns stuff that is more flammable <laughs> than the lighter fluid itself and hopefully you have like a jar of like gherkin juice left over and quite simply it's it's a shot of uh, of something that'll burn going down, followed by a chaser of about a half a shot of a sweeter pickle juice, um, <laughs> and it's wild. And and every bar in our neighborhood, you know, serves it. And uh, it's it's a good it's a good thing. You're you're the hero of the tailgate when you pull those out, or or the enemy, but usually the hero. Oh wow! wow. How do, why is that a Brooklyn thing? Is it just because of New York City's connection to pickles, or what? Why is that? It, you know what, it's, it, they called it the recession special. It, it started at a bar called the uh, Bushwick Country Club, which is the most hipster bar in all of Brooklyn. And, and it was, you know, how do we prepare a cocktail when nobody wants to spend money? And this, is, this came out, I don't know, like four or so years ago. But people have gotten artisanal. They're making their own pickle brine just for <laughs> this. Some people are smoking their pickle brine. They're infusing it with pineapple and this and that. In fact, it's become so popular that the pickle company based in Detroit and Brooklyn called McClure's Pickles now just bottles their pickle juice for people to do pickle shots with. Wow. It's gotten big. Wow. 
<laughs> well, that's crazy. Hey, I just want to let you guys know that uh, Douglas, Douglas is our fourth host. Uh, Douglas Welch is healing from surgery. So we wish him well. And he's actually watching the show, and he says, as someone who makes liqueurs, a fried chicken vodka sounds absolutely disgusting. <laughs> I thought so too. You got to try it, Douglas. And by the way, we just want to state as a disclaimer: Douglas was not harmed in the making of this podcast. His surgery is unrelated to the kitchen party. And and he he also is talking about the uh, the pickle juice shooters. He's um, I, I don't know. And you know he has he he likes some crazy stuff. So he he's not he's not going for it. I think I don't know about this Douglas character. He wants to know what people are doing penance for penance for. <laughs> I'm um, not. I don't know if I understand that, but we'll. Another so so beer is kind of like the go-to. Everybody's gonna bring beer, and the problem is that sometimes that becomes disparate. Everybody has their own little beer, and they huddle around it. I think a fun thing to do is to understand that people are all gonna be coming with beer, and nip that in the bud. Come up with some sort of mixer, like you make a michelada or something like that, and and you kind of bring in a jug of something that's gonna mix into the beer. So you, so you don't have to be the guy that foots the bill for all the hard alcohol, but instead you can kind of unify people with, a, you know, your tailgating drink. And to that wow. point, you know, some other fun things are like you can doll up your beer, right? Like, for example, you have a Tecate. Go to the grocery store and buy a little bottle of stuff called Togarashi. It's this Japanese kind of spice bun. Put it on the rim and, like, boom, you, like, elevated your drink from, like, a three-buck drink to, like, an $8 drink. <laughs> Wait, uh, what, 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 is it spicy or what is that? It's like an eight blend spice. It has some orange rind, black pepper. It's Ooh. it's the most delicious stuff. It's called tobirashi. Uh tobirashi. But you could you could be you you know infusing your own let's say flavored sugar and put that on the rim or a flavored salt or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. You know there are a lot of ways to like kind of take it one step up without packing a lot of equipment. You know for the day. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, when it comes to oh, there we have a prop. Oh no. <laughs> is is that your fried chicken vodka? Oh, your oh, your audio. Your sound your is audio. off. We can't hear you. Okay, I haven't been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> this is the espresso vodka oh. that you make when you soak in coffee beans. We are way off topic, but I don't really care. No, I actually think this is totally on topic. I could see all of these at a at a good tailgate party because I think beer get, yeah. just gets old, and it's also really filling. Like you can, you know, somebody like me who wants to have like ten, twelve drinks. I mean, beer, right. ten, twelve beers that gets old. Well, you know, and I think uh, people like to show off this kind of stuff too, um, and they they have uh, things like oh, we've lost my bed. Um, we've uh, we've got things like um, you know espresso vodka that uh, oh, here comes oh. the. Uh, now it's a party, baby. <laughs> when it should be a real party, not a virtual party. Exactly. I feel like I need to. Drink. All right, now I'm gonna have to drink, right? Okay. Show and tell, but that. What do you got? I'm one. I have okay. An empty glass of water. <laughs> there goes Daniel. For some some reason, I got um, there's a company that sent me this three olives. Sent me this a while ago. This one is espresso vodka. Ooh. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that it says espresso? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost a whole bottle. The root beer vodka was actually pretty good. Oh my gosh. Oh, no, that I can see root beer. Make a root beer float. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. it was pretty good. I used it with ice cream. It was good. These are freezing, oh. by the way. And then tomato. Tomato Ooh. vodka. Ooh. Well, I guess that could be for a Bloody Mary, I suppose, huh? You know, I've actually never had a Bloody Mary. It's vegetarian. That's a good point. But you've never point. had a Bloody Mary? I've, and I've never had a Long Island iced tea. What? Oh. Girl, we got to change that. <laughs> okay, I have ice cubes that light up. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, yeah, that would be good for a party. There you go. So I thought I would they, li they look just like police lights when they light up. So, you know, you'll be used to it when they pull you over. I, I thought I would bring a few kind of fun things that if you can get your hands on are fun for a tailgate or fun just to whip out uh, liquor-wise. Have any of you guys seen this stuff okay. called Root? No. no. Yeah. So this is root beer. It's alcoholic root beer. And it's the most amazing thing in the world. This is this and a, and a little tub of vanilla haagen -Dazs. This is dessert. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's like it kicks up the idea of an affogato 
like beyond, you know, right out of the where, park. Where do you get that? Uh, it's manufactured by a company called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. They're based out of Philadelphia, but any sort of like I guess mid to higher level spirit company is going to sell it. Obviously, depending on distribution. Um, I think it's manufactured now in California. It's really good. Like it's unbelievably good. I I love root beer. I need some of that. Yum. Um, this is another kind of fun thing. This is by the Kings County Distillery. It's a uh, mm. It's a chocolate <laughs> whiskey, and again, like pour this over chocolate ice cream, and it's amazing dessert. And then the one, the, the most bizarre thing that I thought I would bring over is this stuff called balcones, and I thought this is good for sort of like the manlier side of tailgating. This is whiskey um, from Texas that gets that after the distillation process, they smoke it over Texas oak. And it's it's smoked over a type of white oak called scrub oak, and it tastes like liquid barbecue. It's it's unbelievable. Ooh. See, right. see, <laughs> and then they run it over barbed wire, and then they <laughs> take it out over cactus. <laughs> hey, hey, just so you guys know, Douglas says he says he makes his own limoncello, and oh. also a fall flavored liqueur called October Prescription, which has maple pumpkin pie spices. Oh. Well, when Douglas has us all over for his cookies, he can serve us that in shots, <laughs> right? <cookies. laughs> That's how we're going to come to work. He's like healing. That's like, right. It's like, it's like, hurry up and heal, man. we got to get those cookies going. <laughs> That's hysterical. So, you know. Good times. Uh, I, I noticed in Christina. I noticed in your um, your blog post you had different color alcohols, which I thought oh, was really cool. Well, that was um, those were actually Jello shots, and oh. for some reason, amongst our readers, they love some Jello shots. And like, I thought that went out of fashion when I was like nineteen, but apparently not. Like, people are crazy for Jello shots. Who knew? The new thing. And what do you? How do you? How do you prepare them? Well, I mean, I think there's just, I mean, honestly, it's infinite possibilities. The first story we ever did with it was um, holiday jello shots, which I guess is a way to, um, you know, uh, subdue the annoying family while you have to hang out oh, with yeah. them, I guess. <laughs> you just do lots and lots of jello shots. But, um, you know, I mean, you can layer stuff. You know, we did like candy cane jello shots where you layered, you know, with some peppermint flavors. Um, Ooh. Oh, what else do we do? I mean, like, I think layering is always fun, especially with team colors. Um, um, oh gosh, uh, see we did some sort of, we did like a pumpkin pie one, you know, topped it with some whipped cream. I mean, I think there's, there's lots of different possibilities. So it's just a, a matter of sort of finding a point of inspiration and then saying, okay, how can I turn that into a jello shot? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you um, always have to use those boxes of jello or are you actually using gelatin so you don't get that kind of chemically flavor or how do you yeah, do that? Yeah, you can use, you know, the, the unflavored gelatin. And I even saw a couple, I've never done this myself, but I've seen some recipes using, um, agar agar. Oh, you know, yeah. For, for the vegetarians who want to also get drunk. So, right. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned whipped cream. Have any of you seen this alcoholic whipped cream? I've oh, seen no. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's like a, you know, it's like a intimate thing, but it, but I mean, it could also be, it could also be, <laughs> oh, it just, oh. it makes you think like, well, Douglas, let's places. be frank. Uh, Daniel, let's be frank. Um, everything can be an intimate thing. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. I'm just wondering, where else can we be introducing alcohol that we normally don't see alcohol? Cupcakes. Are there, like, cup yeah. Cupcakes? Well, that's How actually that? a whole other story that I did was um, cooking with beer, and they did, they wanted me to do um, beer cakes, so just cakes mm. made with beer. And um, honestly, at first I was like, okay, how are these going to turn out? And they were moist and really flavorful. I mean, I thought it was great. I mean, it's like, why not make every cake with beer? So um, I tried coffee cakes, um, microwave Ooh, that cakes. Good. Uh -huh. um, yeah, lots of different kinds. So I think cooking with beer is, is another angle, especially if you're now looking towards dessert at the, at the event. You know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little history with um, Jeff and um, cakes. He actually made a Thanksgiving meal in a what is that thing called Jeff? I did I had an easy bake Thanksgiving that I did a couple times <laughs> to kind of show off the fact that you know you everything is single serving now and uh, it actually came out pretty wretched but it proved a point um, but you made a but, cake too right yeah I made, I made a little itty bitty cake a little itty bitty pumpkin pies all that kind of stuff 
Um, <laughs> I, you, you know what? I think I think Daniel's right. I mean, there's there's lots of ways that you can put uh, you know whiskey and pork are like you know the peanut butter and jelly of of uh, Southern barbecue. You know, it's it, if you can combine them in any way, you absolutely should because it makes them a great pairing between the the salty and the and the kind of oaky flavor. Right. Oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. So where where can you buy this whipped cream? I mean, I'm just asking for my friends. But... <laughs> Suddenly, it's Fifty Shades of Tailgating. <laughs> hey, that's that's a good cookbook title. We should all write I it. I like that. And make millions. Oh did, did you guys see the Fifty Shades of Chicken? No. Yes. 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 Just, just Google that. It's hysterical. Okay. Yeah. It's hysterical. It made me want to turn vegetarian. Oh my God, Douglas thinks we should make a Guinness cake. Oh, I oh, thought that would be good. I've actually had cupcakes that were Guinness, and they were delicious. Oh my God, mm -hmm. in Austin. Uh, God, I, what is the name of that cupcake shop? Uh, like Sugar Babies, Sugar. Oh my God, I totally forgot. It's a husband and wife that own it. They're so sweet, but it's delicious. Um, yes. What What do you do, like when, you, when you're thinking about your menu for tailgating, what, how do you even, um, how do you even, attack that when you're thinking about like say your party is 30 people 40 people or whatever mm. how do you how do you kind of break that down so that you're not doing a ton of work but you're um, able to feed everyone and how do you know if you have enough food well I think you need to sort of divide and conquer you know think about who all is going to be there and then I like to you know assign the things that I know people are going to show up with something good you know don't don't give the vegetarian the the chicken option that day you know and so I think that you know if you know someone is really is there they're like the cookie queen like have them bring the cookies you know things like that so I think that's you got to sort of uh, properly delegate because you can't do it all or you'll go crazy <laughs> that's that's I think like always a hard thing with with a potluck model in general which is like how do you do you do you do you pay for everything, depending on the size? Do you ask people to chip in? Are you asking people to bring certain things, and then do they have the capacity to do that? And are they just going to bring like a, a you know a, a plate of like semi stale you know vegetables to dip into some you know cream thing? Uh, it's very hard. It's very hard. Well, then you never invite them again. Exactly. <laughs> I guess so. You'll be out of frame. That's why. The that's list. why there's eight games in a season. You know. <laughs> I have a, I have a, uh, there's this thing that I've been looking at pretty recently called Zocos. Have you guys heard of it? No. It's basically like a, it's kind of like your buddies can all like chip in 10 bucks or something. It kind of, it kind of, it's for, it's like an RSVP system for parties, but like you can set a thing, like everybody chips in like five bucks or whatever, and it kind of collects that. It's almost like kickstarting your parties. So once you hit that point, then like the party actually happens because you have enough money. It's, it's, kind like of, it's kind of neat, and we've used it a few times. It works well. I like that. When uh, we were uh, tailgating um, at USC pretty consistently, it, the, the cost of it definitely started to become an issue, and, and people, some people felt like they were doing all the work or they were putting out all the money, and then, of course, the locust would come and like eat all the food and drink and then go off to the next party. And uh, we actually had to, to kind of come to a system where everybody would bring um, something to drink, but um, people would also chip in, and uh, we assigned, we kind of rotated who would be in charge for a particular week. So to try to like delegate the responsibilities, because you, as you point out, you don't want anybody to kind of feel like, you know, they're spending all the money and they're the one that's that's you know constantly shelling out for the party. But I like the Zocos idea. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, that, and that's the whole thing. It's like it depends on how much of a control freak you are obviously like it and you know like if you're if you're comfortable letting everybody bring things and that's i would never do that but you know i'm sure that happens so you mean you would you would if it were up to you you would do you would do all the cooking yourself oh yeah yeah no. totally <laughs> <laughs> that's not even a question um but that's also, it, you know, it depends on where you stand as a host. Uh -huh. I derive a lot of pleasure from that. I want to be you uh -huh. know, serving food, obviously, it's in, probably in your restaurant. But, right. um, but yeah. Um, All right, buddy, I want to tailgate with you. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're <laughs> um, well, you know, that, you know, Renee brings up a good point. How do you plan for Because, you know, if you have 10 people to tailgate, eventually you're going to wind up with, like, 30 how do you plan for you know the people who kind of drift over from the other part of the the car next door or whatnot? Um, are there some foods that work better that are kind of emergency if people show up foods? Well, I mean, I think that I think that foods that you can cook ahead of time, but then you finish, work really well. Um, and one of the ones that 
I, we haven't talked about yet, but is a really great thing are ribs. And most people think of ribs as a long cooking process, and, and it is, but there are ways that you can get pretty close and then finish at the event, and you have the what, what seems like, you know, fresh smoked or grilled ribs um, in no time. And with ribs, there's this, uh, there's this technique that people talk about. They call it 3-2-1. And the idea behind it is that you're going to cook, let's say you're cooking on a grill, you're cooking, or in a smoker, you cook your ribs for, let's say, three hours uh, just by putting them, you know, right in the smoker or less time if it's direct heat. And then you wrap them in foil. And what actually happens is that you, be, you kind of create this air lock and this steam lock, and all of the moisture breaks down all of the collagen, and that's how you get ribs that really, like, fall off the bone. So in a tailgate situation, you can do those first two steps at home, wrap them in foil, put them in your chill chest the night before, and then when people are hungry, just open them up one rack at a time, throw them on the grill there, and in less than, you know, 20 minutes per rack, they're going to be ready to eat, and they're going to be falling off the bone without mm -hmm. them being charred or, or sort of having any sort of bitter or, as I said, acrid flavor. It's a really easy way to do it. That sounds great. Now, now where do you guys find your recipes, uh, or do you use recipes when you, when you tailgate? Bigspace.com. <laughs> check is in the mail, Daniel. <laughs> check is in the mail. Oh, wait. You should have seen last week. I forgot. You, he, we're going to pay it? Daniel a pickle juice, I think. It was like it was like Douglas, and Douglas was like, "I don't know where I can get recipes or whatever he said," and I was like, "What?" And then I had, <laughs> I had muted my mic, and I was like, Douglas! <laughs> he couldn't hear me at all. <laughs> I was like, "Why does he keep talking? Why does he hear me?" <laughs> I was like, "Let's get this together here. What's going on?" Um, that's, that's that's very that's that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, Better Recipes has some recipes as well. Yeah. Well, I, like, I mean, I like to work from recipes because I like to um, you know be able to recreate it again if it's something's a big hit. So, I, I always I always write down my process just to just to have it on record. That's a great point. Yeah. Hey, you guys, Jody from last week, you know, uh, Nostrovia. Uh -huh. CA. Uh, she said with she said for with, to Douglas the Guinness is good for you for cake, and she said with cream cheese icing. She uh -huh. calls it a health elixir. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Is that the kind of frosting that you had when you had them, Babette? Was it a cream cheese frosting? I think it was, but it almost had a little bit of a, um, oh God, what was it? It was like a, it seemed like mint, but I don't think it was mint, mm. um, but it was delicious. If you guys, if you guys come back to Austin for Tech Munch Austin in March, um, we'll take you there. Uh, we'll have to do a road trip out there. And we have to go back to the Salt Lake too, right? <laughs> Ooh. And I do have pictures of the two of them with many, many little like cowboy hats <laughs> that I'm using if for for um, if if I ever need to pull it out of my you know of no, my. I I will put a check in the mail if you do not use that photo. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there's, there's this picture. What is that? <laughs> you guys are hysteric. Now, Daniel and Christina, uh, what if? If you could make like the perfect menu, what would it consist of for tailgating? Like, I mean, it, money is no object. Uh, place, you know, season, time, whatever. What would what would your meal look like? Oh my goodness. Well, I'll start. Yeah, I mean, my meal so. would be kind of it would be meat focused. It would all be finger food because I don't want to have to have plates all over the place and the cleanup is too much. Um, I would. I, I'm a. I, we serve no sauce at our barbecue place. We're anti sauce completely, um, wow. so that would not be an issue uh, in terms of the cleanup there. Um, but I really like the idea of variety within a constraint. So, for example, you create a taco bar with two or three proteins, and people can make their own thing, or you go to your sort of more artisanal or butch whatever butcher shop and buy three or four different types of fun sausages, and, and you're going to be growing them off, and you kind of create your own fixings bar. So then you load it up, and maybe you're doing first a hot dog, and then, you know, a uh, chorizo or kielbasa, andouille, whatever that is, and you get to kind of go down the menu and try different sausages. Um, so I think that that's kind of a fun, playful way of looking at it, where you create a vertical, mm -hmm. and then you can expand. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things, I think, in that same model, and we haven't really talked about it yet, are 
chicken wings, which I feel like oh, is like the, that's like yeah. that's the king food, right? Um, right, right. And, and it's actually it's uh, I have to give the red, the credit to um, Kenji from SeriesEats.com, but he put out this wonderful recipe where you basically mix half part salt and baking soda, toss your chicken in it the night before, pop it in the chill chest. And the next day, you just throw them in the oven, and because of the the change in alkalinity, you they when they cook, um, you've altered the pH of the skin, so they blister up, and they basically come out as if they were fried, but oh. you don't have to deep fry them. Wow! And then you can create your own dipping sauces, so people can, you know, kind of dip their wings in whatever sauce they want, and do the same kind of thing where you have like a a wings dipping fixing bar. Wow! Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds you, awesome. I mean, does that work for other? Pieces of chicken too. I mean, could you sort of have like recreate fried chicken that same? You know, besides just wings. I think that, that there's a there's a surface area issue. Um, I, I haven't tried it, but you know, the other problem is that I think that one of the problems with fried chicken is just that wings work well because the actual the actual size of the protein is a lot smaller, so it can cook mm -hmm. faster and more evenly. I think that if you were to do that, you'd start to actually burn the exterior because mm -hmm. the amount of time that it takes to cook the interior. Mm -hmm. Of the chicken wing itself, but I, I could be wrong. I, I don't know. And these are chicken wings that can go directly on the grill. You don't need a pan or anything. They can go directly on the. This is an oven recipe. Oven uh, recipe. So you can pop it in a 425 degree oven for 20 minutes or until the juices run clear. Um, but you can also do wings on the grill. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm actually like the grill is my least favorite cooking device in the world, and that's because I like fat. And and with with a grill, you're losing all of the fat right into the grate, which is why I'm always an advocate of putting cast iron down first or something uh -huh. like that. Yeah. Yeah, I I like that. I'm gonna have to try that. I love chicken wings. The chicken wings are, are are kind of tricky to me because you know it's if you're trying to do it on a grill. Uh, I think Deanna makes an excellent point. If you're trying to do it on the grill, sometimes. You can you can have a, a a fire that's too hot, and before you know it, you've gone through two dozen chicken wings like they're matchsticks. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think a, a little preparation ahead uh, and indirect heat goes a long way with those. But uh, I'm definitely going to have to try that technique you were talking about. And so you would, Daniel, you would cook those at home and then package them up and take them to the party and put them out there. No, this is this is like you you do this in your fridge. And then you kind of just throw them down on a baking sheet, and you keep. I mean, it's again, and that's the other thing with with a with the small. Here's a here's a key, right? The smaller the protein, the faster you want to eat it. So a chicken wing is something that you kind of want to eat pretty quickly out of the oven because uh -huh. it, it's starting. It'll start to lose oh, its yeah, moisture yeah. and flavor really quickly. When you have a bigger piece of protein, like a brisket or pulled pork, or well, you know, a pork shoulder you have much more flexibility in how long it will last. Um, and of course, sauce proteins, like you're going to do things like a, uh, a chili, which is, that's a great thing to do, to use a pork shoulder for. Uh, like that will last a long time, and there's less of sort of this drastic impulsive rush to have to like get the food quickly. It can be a, like, a slightly more casual affair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just don't buy that there has to be, that you have to have bad food because it's tailgate food. Oh, I'm that, totally with you. I'm totally with you. But you I, I, and I think you guys are proving that, that you can really kind of, you can make it a fantastic meal. Um, it really doesn't matter where, where you're doing it. Yeah. Now, Christina, what about you? If you had your dream team meal, what would it be? Oh, my gosh. I, you know, I don't even know because I always like to have some kind of jumping off point. You know what I mean? Like what's... Like, like you were saying, some sort of inspiration to have a through line of things to come off of. So when there's no parameters, I don't know. I got to think of some sort of parameter. <laughs> Otherwise, the sky's the limit, I suppose. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Vegetarian. Vegetarian. <laughs> oh, my. He's just trying um, to fuck this out of you. What, I, well, let me think. Vegetarian stuff. Um, well, well, let's see. I mean, I guess, like, you know, different vegetable kebabs and stuff are always fun, you know, <laughs> the on a stick thing. Um, what else is, I don't know. I'm not very experienced vegetarian. Babette, we have a, a popular recipe that uh, our the LA Times Test Kitchen manager Noel Carter put together, and it's an ed uh, edamame spread. And she uses it. She's a huge tailgater, and she uses it to make um, sandwiches for vegetarians at uh, at tailgate parties. So I'm going to get you that recipe. So that you will delicious. you will have something to eat at the next tailgate party. <laughs> <laughs> 
but the problem is now, okay, if I find the right food, I still don't like the sports. Yeah. So I have to. <laughs> well, that, that's why you have alcohol. So you don't, it doesn't really matter who's doing what. <laughs> that's the biggest problem when I'm like, okay, there is no food here I can eat. And mm -hmm. I don't like the sports. So mm -hmm. every, everyone's like so focused on the TV. And they're like, go, 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 go. And you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> And there's like this secret code everyone knows. I'm like, help me. What they should do is when you walk in the door, they should give you a printout that basically decodes all of the words so that you know what all the stuff means. So you can just look at it and be like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I understand. <laughs> Babette, I think you just developed a new business. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about cleanup? How, how do you guys handle cleanup when, you ha when you're like cooking for a whole bunch of people? I mean, w when you're out on the road, how do you, because I know, like, we went, I went to Burning Man, and the philosophy is what you bring in, you have to take out. So all that trash, everything, we, we take out everything that's extra with trash, so all the extra packaging, we discard that even before we get into the campsite. So do you recommend doing stuff like that? Is it almost the same kind of philosophy where you're like, just get rid of everything you don't need before you get to camp? You have all your stuff, and then is there a system for throwing stuff away so that you got it? Or is that just too weird? So weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean we're, you know, I don't know where you're tailgating, <laughs> but... Are there trash cans? Yeah, aren't there <laughs> trash cans where you're tailgating? <laughs> you know, maybe this is why you don't get invited, Babette. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just yeah, we would invite Babette, but, but she's really together. kind of a clean freak, so let's not bring her up. <laughs> All right, fine, fine. You know, we have about uh, three minutes left to the show, but I want to make sure Daniel and Christina have um, a little bit of ample time to tell us what they're working on, because we didn't really talk about that in the beginning. I want to know about this new restaurant. I want to know what Christina's doing. So do you guys, uh, which one, who wants to start? Daniel, do you want to just kind of... Um, tell us what you're working on, and also where can we, where can folks find you when they get done watching the show? Where else can they get uh, your brilliance? Sure. So we, we, I'm now opening a barbecue place in New York, and we kind of took a different approach to doing that, which is that we, we've, we've kind of crowdfunded a barbecue restaurant. Um, we started with a series called Brisket Lab, and we got folks that to pre-order 3,200 pounds of brisket in 48 hours online, uh, $25 a pound, and then using those pre-orders, we kind of launched a whole series where every other day we were developing barbecue and kind of tweaking it and iterating it to create something mind-blowing. And it came out really successfully. We were voted by Texas Monthly as the best barbecue in New York, and we decided to take that and move it to an actual restaurant. We've done the same crowdfunding method. Our first day of sales, we sold 4,000 pounds of barbecue. And uh, and using that capital, we're opening up our uh, impending pop-up shop called Brisket Town, which will be opening up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, hopefully on October 31st. And you can uh, check it out at DelaneyBBQ.com and follow me on Twitter, which is twitter.com slash Daniel Delaney. That's the pitch. Are you, are you gonna Are you gonna ship? Can we get some of that out here? For you, yes. Uh, <laughs> right. But. For everybody else, and no. unfortunately, you know, gotta come to New York. <laughs> That's just, you know, I wonder if, if, because we're supposed to be doing another tech munch in New York. I wonder if we should do like, how, how big is the space? Can we do like a meetup or something like that at your new restaurant? Totally. We also have a huge outdoor like smoker area that we could host something in. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be cool. Okay, we'll have to talk about that later. And I'm definitely coming so I can check in on Fair Square so I can be the mayor of Brisket Town. <laughs> Christina, what do you have going on? Uh, yeah, well, so I, um, I'm still working on BetterRecipes.com, and I actually just... Um, became the owner of a, of a new website, it, new to me. It's, it's a website that's been around since 1997, and I just, uh, I just took it over. And it's, um, it's a website entirely dedicated to cooking contests. So it's called uh, Cooking Contest Central, and I'm in the process right now of uh, revamping it all, and then I'm excited for a, a brand new debut in a couple of months. And um, you know, hopefully, you know, our, our members love to enter and win lots and lots and lots of recipe contests, and so I'm there to sort of uh, support them. Yeah, I did a story on them a couple of years back, um, just about the whole culture of that, and uh, they have just such a great energy uh, in that community, so I know you'll do great. 
I'm, I'm super excited. I got to go find that story now. I got to go find that. That's cool. Yeah, Jeff, I want to read that too. Maybe you could tweet that out. Uh, sure, absolutely. No, it's been a, it's been a couple of years, so I have to probably dig through the archives. But it was amazing to me, sort of, because I was writing about Pillsbury, the Pillsbury Bake Off, and as I kind of pulled that apart, it was like monkey bread. You know, you you get one contestant <laughs> for Pillsbury, and they've they, and they've been in ten contests, and then yeah. you go to this other person, and they've they've entered every contest that you can have, and you ask them, you're like, okay, well, how much money have you won? Oh, oh I've never won any money. You know, it's just the, the glory of the free apron or, you know, to, the, to be able to have that ribbon that said I had the first prize. So it was, well, on, it was, on the flip it, side, it some lovely of our, people. Yeah, and on the flip side, some of the members of this site have won like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. so it's, it's crazy. But with Pillsbury, of the members of this site, they usually make up about one third of the contestants. So, yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. they're pretty hardcore. So it's cool. Yeah, and, it, and there, are, there are sort of the grand doms of, uh, of contests. So it was, it was great to meet all of them. Neat. Well, when you get that site revamped, let us all know. Yes, yes. I'm excited to uh, show it off and re-debut it. All right, guys. I guess this is, this is it. Okay, well, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Game wait a second. The road. Wait, I have, I have one last thing. Daniel, are you going to tell me about that whipped cream or what? <laughs> I'll send you some, personally. I, I don't know where you can get it. Like some, with the same place that you get edible undies, I, I would assume has it. I, I have no clue. <gasps> Uh, I saw it online. I've never tasted it. I'm okay. expecting it to be god awful, but I have no clue where. Okay, you're find it. I'll, I'll I'll have my friend do some googling. Okay, I think you can get it at the grocery store. <laughs> I, I, something is telling me it's at the grocery store, and I think I've seen okay. it. Uh, I don't know where you shop for groceries. But... <laughs> you know, you know. I actually made a. I went to a Scotch um, meeting. I know we got to end, but I went to a Scotch group. There's a there's a group here in Los Angeles that are like. Scotch drinkers, it's insane, it's crazy, they're awesome. Um, and I made a, a butterscotch pudding with a whipped cream that was infused with scotch. It was delicious. It was so good, it was like the best thing at the party. Everyone was dying, they're like, I need to have the recipe, and I'm like, you don't want to know what's in this recipe. <laughs> no good can come from this recipe. This recipe has everything that is evil. Um, <laughs> So you can make your own. Well, you know, we'll have to do, Renee, we'll have to go into the test kitchen. We will have to you make. You know what? We'll have to do that. Flavored, flavored um, uh, whipped cream. We'll just have to do that. Done, we'll just have, done we'll, and done. And then, and then we're going to make a cookbook with Cookbook Cafe that's all of the recipes we make. Like the, the quintessential flavored uh, whipped cream cookbook. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Renee, Jeff, you guys are awesome as always. Douglas, we miss you. We can't wait till you come back next week. Hopefully, you will be back. Well, soon. Daniel, I know he's, he's recovering, but he's doing great. Uh, but he watched the whole show, which is good. And he said Bailey's Irish cream is what was on that cupcake, which is true. That's exactly what was on the cupcake. Mm. Uh, Daniel, I wish you so much success with your new venture. It sounds incredible. It sounds. I was so impressed when I saw you had a you had a thing one time where you were you were charging sponsorships every single day, and you figured out a way to make it a dollar a day but it would it would incrementally get bigger and I was like this guy is brilliant <laughs> everything you do works out and is amazing Christina the exact same thing you I've known you for a really long time since you were a member of Bake Space we did that video together really early on you've been a huge supporter always a talent uh, you are gorgeous as always and uh, we'll, we'll be supporting you and in, in whatever you guys uh, whatever, whatever both of you guys do we will be supporting you a hundred percent so Renee Jeff would you like to say anything before we leave I'm gonna go make some flavored whipped cream Goodbye. <laughs> I'm gonna go read the Bible <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you right. so much. Join us oh. each week for a new show. Thursdays, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Yeah, it's 8 p.m. Eastern. Kitchen party. You can find out more at Google Plus, which is the Bakespace.com account, or at bakespace.com slash news and uh, hopefully tonight we're relaunching our site, by the way, guys, with a new design. So I'm excited. So I uh, will see you guys later. And thank you so much for joining us, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.